The Sphere Project came at a particular moment in history right after the Rwanda genocide. The context at the time was the end of the age of humanitarian innocence. Yeah, it was a very difficult time for everyone. There was a huge amount of soul searching about the humanitarian business. So everybody was looking for an answer. And it became increasingly apparent to us that something had to change, something had to be done. Part of the history of the establishment of the sphere was a multi-donor evaluation of the response to the Rwanda genocide, in particular in Eastern Congo. The main learning from the Rwanda evaluation was that the humanitarian agencies um, had done pretty good work, but there were some failings. 40,000 people died of cholera under our noses in Goma in the first four weeks of that crisis. There were definitely agencies working in, in the camps in Goma and Bukavo in Eastern Zaire that were not competent, that were not professional, and they should not have been allowed access to those populations. We on the NGO side were also looking at how we could quantify what we said in the Code of Conduct. The Red Cross and the NGO Code of Conduct came out of initially a, um, a searching on the part of Red Cross and Red Crescent societies. It was the first time, I think, that the humanitarian community had attempted to lay down some sort of global sense of how it should behave. The NGO Code of Conduct is ethical principles, but the question is what does that look like when you're actually implementing work? Once the Code of Conduct had been produced, the sort of obvious next step was, well, if this is how you should behave, then what is it you should be doing? You want the true story? Uh, Peter Walker from the Federation, uh, the IFRC, and myself, who I was then Emergencies Director in Oxfam GB, um, met a number of times. Okay, so Sphere actually started with a six-pack of beer on a mountainside in Switzerland. To discuss um, issues, so policy issues, operational issues associated with the difficulties of that situation of that and the response. Guy came next to Stockton, who at the time was working for Oxfam and myself, and quite literally we were sitting on this hillside and just thinking, well, what do we need to do to move this business forward? And they, we said, well, we need to go more than the code of conduct. And that's where we started. And I can remember in that afternoon, we drafted out, well, what should this look like? And together we, we uh, knocked up a project proposal, I think in 1995. We then managed to get the steering committee for humanitarian response, which was this uh, amalgam of big networked NGOs. Both he and I were on their policy uh, committee. So we took this idea and we got the policy committee to accept it. It then goes up to the chief executives. The chief executives like the idea and if voila, we have a mandate. At the same time, there'd been an initiative in the USA and out of that had come um, a set of um, proposals for developing standards which Interaction, the US NGO consortium, was running. And in a meeting that we held in Geneva, I think in early 97, um, both sides of the Atlantic, as it were, were involved in this, the SCHR and Interaction, and also, I think I'm right in saying ICVA and VOICE were involved fairly early on. We um, had a, a discussion about these different strands of initiatives that were going on and thought, well, it would be better to try and pull this into a single project, um, and uh, which is what we did. Um, it became known as uh, the Sphere Project after the first project manager, Susan Purdin, came up with that name. I had been thinking about the standards project and trying to figure out how to, how to label it. So I played with the word standards project, humanitarian, so S, P, H, and finally I came to call it Sphere. So the image of the globe, the, the name Sphere, its ability to be translated into other languages, the idea was that it was a global effort. 
when we started working on it, the, the, the real, I think, motive became, can we turn this around? And instead of this being all about what do agencies do, how can we make this into something which is about what do people caught up in crisis have a right to expect? What would you expect from the people who come to assist you? Do you expect them to be competent? Of course you do, because you're putting your life in their hands. So how do you define that competency? And it seemed to us at the time that the, the way to, to capture this notion of competence was to lay down some sort of minimal standard, not, not one that is rigorous in terms of thou shalt deliver 2,000 calories or whatever, but something that allows people to understand what it is they're trying to achieve with their programming. And we knew it was about that which people really need to stay alive. Food, water, health, shelter. In the process of developing standards in the different topic areas, the effort was to bring together the thoughts of all the best minds in, who are conducting humanitarian work and try to develop a consensus on what the standards should be for best practice in, in doing the work. Um, and trying to do that in the period of a, a one-year timeline was daunting. When we were close, to having final versions of the standards when we wanted to test, to, to take them out to the field and see what people thought. So there were meetings in Sarajevo and Harare, in places that had had a humanitarian emergency to, to test with the people on the ground what their impressions were. One of the decisions we made was not to take all the resources necessary in order to accomplish the one-year project from an individual donor. But what we did was solicit resources from the top 10, 12 humanitarian donors. The idea of having multiple donors and multiple agencies was so that it would be a, a product of all of the actors in the humanitarian enterprise. The Humanitarian Charter was there primarily as a means to address the question, who, who are we? So what we were trying to grasp at is, you know, what are we doing this for? Is this just because we want to feel good about being competent and thus professional and we want to set professional standards? Well, no, it's because you sincerely believe that the people you are assisting actually have a right. They have a right to life with dignity. That's why you do this stuff. And if you can then show that actually these standards don't just come out of thin air. They're not just something that agencies have invented. They're actually an expression of people's rights that states over the last 50, 60 years have signed up to. We're not in this because we've been ordered to be uh, as, a, as a military uh, undertaking. We're not in this because we've been um, uh, contracted in. We're not in this um, because we're there to try to deliver some longer-term political good. We're here to do our best to uphold the rights of all people because that's what our organisations have a moral and ethical contract to deliver on. What does that mean in a crisis? Well, one way of thinking about it is it means that they are able to acquire these things, water, health, shelter, to these standards. And, and that really matters, that sense that it's about people's rights, not just about a technical standard. It's not fair to say that everything started with SPHERE. There was effort before that to, to do good practice. SPHERE codified that, put it into a package that made it easier for other people to pick up. When the SPHERE standards were launched, I think there was a broad sense of accomplishment throughout the NGO community because the process was so participatory. It really did bring together very disparate organizations and people for the purpose of improving the practice of the entire humanitarian community. Having the standards, yes, that's really important. But having that process of reaching those standards was, was equally important. But something like Sphere doesn't happen on its own. It, it, it's a timing thing. It was post-Rwanda. It was a sense that agencies had to change. Well, the commitment of the organizations that were part of that first management team was absolute. 
it was seen to be a critically important uh, responsibility, I think, that these organizations had as leaders in the humanitarian sector. When Sphere started, if you think about the people who were involved, they were all relatively young. They all came out of a very sort of action-oriented background. They were somewhat anti-establishment, right? They, they were some mavericks. Those are the sort of people who end up in aid agencies. It was a small group of people who were uh, incredibly creative, imaginative, uh, had a lot of expertise, a lot of knowledge, and were willing to put aside their own organizational boundaries in order to do something together. Thank you.